Yeah. Can you check? Just check. Make sure it's rolling. I'm yeah. pretty sure it is. <laughs> First weed of the day. First weed of the day. Yeah, getting into it. Get, getting our vape on. <laughs> when we've been vaping exclusively. Yeah. Yeah, which I was doing when I met you guys before I turned to the dark side again. <laughs> no, the, the smoking is on the dark side. I don't mean to draw it towards it. No, it's... Uh, um, but yeah, no, the vape is nice. It's just like... Seems like an upgrade in the ritual that's slower, you know, like the pace of it. Yeah. Feels like it's grounding and brings you into a presence even with that, you know, like yeah. you have to wait for it to heat up and like it doesn't really even hit you as fast, you know, it's more of like a yeah. slow burn. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. It's a whole different way of doing yeah. it. This podcast brought to you by the volcano. Yeah. I know. They can sponsor us whenever they get I their know. heads I don't straight. think they need sponsors though because like mm-hmm. you They're buy so one, and you just buy one and then you and have you it have for, it the, for rest the rest of, of your life. Yeah. Definitely a great investment. And also like the vaped bud that comes out of there. You save that and you can make the dopest edibles ever. Well, that's the biggest thing about it is I feel like I'm appreciating the weed, you know, and that's become a big part of my We're weed practice it. is honoring the weed. And even if I am smoking it, like if I smoke weed, um, I like I inhale and I take a big hit and I hold it and I don't really think you even need more than one hit, especially no. when you're smoking, you know, No. Um, and I kind of became like a weird stickler about appreciating her for my years of smoking. And it really comes from like everything um being non-appreciative probably and a little bit abusive when i first met her and my brother really having to like pull me in line about like you're like burning the whole bowl mary yeah, you're not appreciating yeah. it you know and having to like sensitize myself to mm. uh making the most of her but yeah making edibles out of these which you have been doing the past couple times you yeah. made the cookies yeah you've I'm been our baker boy i'm a you fucking baker such a good boy job. I'm, a, I'm your muffin man <laughs> you are the muffin man. i'll come through <laughs> with the activated muffins yeah um, I, I wanted to mention at the beginning of this yeah. uh, that Cass and I put out, or it'll be it'll oh. be like the afterglow to this episode. It's kind of the craziest thing Cass and I have ever recorded, because uh, on the heels of our last podcast uh, called Thruples Therapy with Star, of course, we just have a bunch of people that are new to our podcast that are like, yeah. how did you guys start doing this? Like, yeah. how did you, basically, how did we get to the point where we could be doing this with you? Yeah. And we talked about it. Yeah. Yeah, TMI, too much information. Yeah. But yeah, we, we got into great detail about how we, we got to here. So it's a sexy, cringy, good fucking time for all. And that's on patreon.com slash church of chill with a whole bunch of other bonus content. Yeah, that's a that's a real gem. Um, yeah. Yeah, and Cass is just um, on her producer. She's just right here in the other room. Mindset, yeah, today, getting her work done. Don't worry, she's still queen, but we're... Uh, we're holding down the church while she works in the steeple or whatever. Cass the other day told me, she was like, I like when you call Mare like a queen and a princess and we treat her like that, but I don't want to be that. And I'm like, that's fine. I, you know, it's weird. Yeah. You know, I was like, that's, yeah, that's cool. You know, you don't have to be royalty. Mare could be our royalty. <laughs> Royal blood. <clears throat> yeah. Try and learn what makes her happy. <laughs> <laughs> so we're here. We're yeah. Here at, we uh, just, Yeah. We just watched the Lee Scratch Perry doc. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Fuck. That's definitely worth mentioning. I'm still digesting that one. Yeah. It's on um, Criterion uh, Channel. On uh, on I don't know how else you could track that down. Maybe it's on YouTube. But there's a a documentary called The Upsetter about legendary Jamaican producer Lee Scratch Perry. And... uh, yeah, I I, you, I I sign up to watch any fucking music doc because I'm going to end up inspired, even if it's just like a, a moving Wikipedia entry, yeah. which is what I assumed that was going to be. All right. I was like, we'll go and we'll get the information we need about Lee Scratch Perry. And instead, we kind of went in through the heart of darkness. Fuck. Yeah, way more crazy and complex than I thought it was going to be. Um, yeah, we'd recommend it to anybody interested in spirituality, music, psychedelics, cannabis, cannabis. Um, he was somebody that was clearly incredibly tapped in one foot over the line and uh, yeah. was channeling a lot of very profound and prophetic stuff um, yeah. that was documented mostly on like home film, like camera, yeah. like, yeah, um, which but I love. You also watch him go mad, um, which is always innately fascinating, I think. And um, yeah, I just got just so much out of that and so much out of just the human experience of insanity and complexity and morality. And he said something really 
uh, hit deep in my gut too about weed and righteousness, um, referencing Paul McCartney when Paul McCartney was in Japan and um, got locked up for traveling with some weed. And ten Lee days. Scratch Perry, 10 days, and Lee Scratch Perry wrote to the Japanese government to get him out, which I guess worked. And he was talking about that Paul is um, somebody who has to deal with a lot of righteousness in this lifetime. And so he needs the spirit of weed to carry um, him through. Yeah. Um, and I just thought that was just so, so unendingly fascinating to think well, about. Well, he channeled something. That was, that was yeah. not even his words. Yeah. It was just they channeled right through totally. him. Like, hey, people like Paul McCartney, beings like this that we should be very glad took form. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sometimes they need the spirit with them. Yeah, because they're dealing with so many other spirits. They're or, dealing with, so they're, yeah, they're dealing with so much. It's uh, it's when Pod entered my life. You know, I never, it like, it, it came to me when I was starting to uh, be thrust into more of a public thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm, I know I'm not, like, famous or anything yeah. like that, but, like, I started smoking pot at 30 when my films were, like, popping off. Yeah. And there was a lot of attention and interviews and stuff like that. and. Um, it helped me speak to what I, I do better. It helped me tap into a deeper connection to what I do. And so, yeah, obviously helped me a lot, but uh, Lee's relationship with it, you know, evolved over time. He fucking smoked for 40 years nonstop and then he gave it up for a little bit. And I'm pretty sure at the end of his life, he brought it back. Cause what the fuck? Yeah. Yeah. The whole thing really brought me back to this quote that I've been saying and thinking about my whole life about uh, people say, oh, we're all in the same boat. And I've always thought we're not in the same boat, but we're in the same storm. Some people are in yachts. Some people are in life rafts. Some and people just have like a half a life jacket and they're just like holding Exactly. It the Some people are naked pole man. <laughs> if you get that reference. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I've recently lost my mind more than I've like ever lost my mind in my life. Not like literally, definitively more than I've ever lost my mind in my life. And it's made, it's brought me back to that quote and it's made me reframe it even more thinking that we're not in the same storm mm -hmm. because the best way to describe what I feel like the exper experientially what's been happening to me is that all my life I've been wading through like a really rough river and there's been rapids and things to get around and things to navigate and then that river opened up into an ocean like a super rough ocean. And what I was navigating um, not only expanded in complexity, but weight and gravity. Wow. And it felt like I wasn't in the same storm anymore. Mm. Um, and it's brought me to such a deeper place of not just humility, but compassion and under like just a breadth of abstract understanding for um, the differences in experiences and what people are going through, mm. you know, with mental health. Because I think like you, I've been very will centric my whole life, um, in diminishing, uh, over the course of time, I sort of started out that way. Um, and always kind of been super headstrong with my mood, no matter what's been going on in my life and sort of, uh, or identified that it was a part of my value of being able to will through chemical imbalances like depression or anxiety or things that I seem to inherit or seem to have to face in life. And, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't know. That philosophy has really broken down as I've aged, you know, and I've really, um, uh, yeah, I've leaned less into what willpower can do. And it seems like um, just coming to a more wide berth of like, oh, um, it's, it's, it can't all be about the assertion of, of, of morality or identity um, to solidify something into comfortability. Sometimes it is about like floating into the complexity of chaos and letting life yeah. happen, if that makes sense. So it's the opposite of, of willpower. Yeah. It's like uh, letting go. Yeah. It's it's, a, it's submitting. And so uh, when, when you reference you going through the worst mental health episode of your life, this is like the end of last month we're talking about, beginning of February, end yeah. of January. Yeah, yeah. When we were in L.A. Um, yeah, it was crazy. It was crazy to be around. It was crazy to bear witness to. Um, tried to hold, hold space, but uh, you know how I am. I get sucked right into it. Cass holds great space. Um, but yeah. <sighs> yeah, what happened? What does that feel like, you know? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> it feels like for the past um, couple years, I've been getting uh, an incredible amount of 
what people reference as downloads these days. And I would have never mm. used that language. And I'm not sure I still like it. But What's with all this download? <laughs> it does seem like I got to a high enough frequency in my life or I quieted down enough, I should probably say, that I started to be able to hear um, things that felt more, again, the language is so limited, but more intuitive and less fearful, more grounded in something, more grounded in myself. And those truths, just like any spiritual awakening, tended to be really uncomfortable because they meant that I would have to align myself with something different, or I wasn't aligned, but I was in incongruence in parts of my life. Yeah. You know, and when we have, when we say spiritual awakening, it's like, I think we imagine like sunshines and rainbows, you take acid and you like can talk to spirits now. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it's usually a, a, f a flood of realizations of how you've been poisonous and polluting and not in line with whatever moral, moral code you have. And uh, I've, I've definitely gotten myself into the deepest holes and, and the Lee Scratch Perry documentary is interesting to watch this too, where it seems like righteousness gets, uh, gets the best of me or I, or I, I get solidified in some sort of moral imperative I think that's going on outside of myself. That's mm -hmm. when I can get really, really trapped mm -hmm. in uh, the duality of like I'm a bad person and I don't deserve to be here, you mm -hmm. know. Um, and it's, it seems like in my experience of life, uh, there aren't moral imperatives. It doesn't seem like there's a singularity or a God. I haven't experienced that, but there are a lot of them. There's a lot of them to attune to. And I think the more that I've experienced experience, it seems like, oh, I'm one of them. Mm -hmm. um, and we were you know, talking about insourcing earlier, and I think that's like always the, the mental health journey. And um, I think for somebody like myself who's so open and so changeable and so like receptive is the same thing as open, but receptive to becoming different. Um, solidifying personality has been hard for me in my lifetime and that's been hard for people. Like you could diagnose me with bipolar, you could diagnose me with borderline personality disorder. Um, and tattoos from a really young age felt like a solidification I could deal with. And which is really interesting. Uh, you know, because many people that know me, I think have brought this question up to me a lot because if you know me, you know how changeable I am. Yeah, you're r really the most, and it would, yeah. you would not seem like that because it seems like, whoa, that's a person who knows yeah. she's set in her ways. But like a little like, hey, it doesn't have to be like that. You're like, yep, okay, cool. And you, you got it. And you just like, it's crazy. It's yeah, and I've had very adaptable. Yeah, and I've it's even part of the reason why I was like celibate before I met you guys and alone for so long for four years because I know how much people around me affect me, especially if I'm having sex with them, and I know how much I attune to people, and I was so precious and protective about attuning to people other than myself. <laughs> yeah. Um, but anyways, I have never had a hard time getting tattooed. It's always felt very liberating to me. Um, I have always had a hard time being in a body ever since like a very young age. Um, like I said, like, you know, I don't want to get too dark or real on this episode, but I like cut from a really young age. I started cutting on my body. Um, I was going to ask you that. We never really yeah, talked we have about that. Yeah. We've talked about eating disorders and like a yeah. lot of other ways things manifest, but yeah, you, you, you were a cutter too. Yeah, I was a, yeah. I, and I had the conception of like cutting myself out of this body. And so I like really was grounded in some other realm from a very, very young age, which has been good and very bad in my life. Um, but yeah, very destructive, very destructive with my body. Like the eating disorder I had was bulimia and that's very physically destructive. It's not just like, oh, I'm not eating. It's like, it's like actively kind of aggressive and brutal, yeah. you know? Yeah. <clears throat> and I think I really up until this point, and you could say this at any point in your life, I guess, have not realized the brutality of my existence and how hard I've been on myself and how that's not just like a... It's been physical, but it's also a thought form thing and how I relate to myself and others and really what this whole goddamn Saturn return feels like it's about. How do I want to relate to people? Mm. How do I want to align myself with that? Because um, I think I had a conception that I was relating in a way that I, I thought was in line with who I want to be, but really was not. It's very painful to come to those, or even excruciating, you could say, coming to those conclusions of how wrong you've been, mm. you know, where you want to be and where you are and the dissonance and the chasm between those two things. Um, but yeah, I've been having a little bit of a hard time throwing away uh, around the weight that I've thrown around in my career over the past couple of years and in my life and the karmic exchange I have with people and it being so brutal and cut, cutting people open. I know there's different language I could be using for what I do, but there's also this language. Um, 
and um, a harshness. And I think I went through a really brutal experience. I think part of getting tattooed was maybe a little bit traumatizing. I've usually just gotten tattooed by friends um, that I was like smoking weed with. And it was a little bit of a different situation. And it didn't feel like I was doing it to be cool. Like I know a lot of people like the question about why do you get tattooed is it will never be answered, but it definitely has never been around coolness. If anything, it's like I, I felt uncool and I've, I've known that I've not been like a cool person to get tattooed, but the desire to like change things and that's what it is like to change my body was so strong that it could like override those other things. Yeah. And I also think there's probably some sort of Freudian frame you could put around it with like my mother being partially abusive and then me abusing myself and or me being taken advantage of when I was in high school by a guy and a lot of people say it like girls will speak to getting tattooed after experiences like that because they feel more protected like people will fear them more and stuff and I don't know I don't know if any of that stuff is actually going on or just like intellectual frameworks I have for uh like funneling it seems like <laughs> controlled experience. pain it's you know yeah yeah um it's your version of uh, Lee Perry burning, burning down his studio <laughs> with a smile on his face. Yeah, no, it's definitely that. <laughs> it's definitely that. And uh, I felt like I had, I had, I felt like I had the official, official version of that recently with my body, with these flames that I have tattooed. Um, this is all like abstract line work, um, but it's poetic, just as the rest of life is, and all, as all tattoos are. And it really does feel like it's burned me out of myself and this old version of myself, and really. I don't know, like, I, I, I felt the attention even psychically I got by getting tattooed, and I hated it. Just now when we were in L.A.? Mm-hmm. Like, I hated it. I hated it so much, and I'm... Well, you're meeting, I mean, to, to frame it, you're meeting all of our, you're meeting new friends for you, very old friends for us, and everyone's like, why are you guys out here? And we're like, Mayor got the dopest tattoo ever. And you were getting attention for that. I mean, you were the reason we were out there. We were introducing you to people. There was a lot of attention on you on that trip, just in general. Yeah. I mean, I think I, yeah, it's like I, I've come to understand what I want to represent. And what I want to represent is that people don't have to do anything to their bodies to be happy. And that actually the path is to acceptance. It's, it's not to do something. It's not to change it. And it feels like I've been antithetical to that. It felt like I was antithetical to that. It felt like what I was representing was antithetical to that. It felt like... I was, uh, my influence was bad because it was going to cause a lot of other people to feel like they had to go through the pain that I, I put myself through. And I, I mean, there's so many things about it and I'm not going to get into all of it on here because I think a lot of it is a little bit too dark even to air, but, um, yeah, it's, it, it, it came with a lot of insecurity and self-loathing that I, uh, Everybody deals with that. I've dealt with that my whole life, but in this like physical crushing way, like before we left for LA, I was waking up stoked. I wasn't smoking weed during the day. I was running almost every day. It felt like things were easy. Like whatever I was waiting through was, was easier. It was a stream. I wasn't going upstream. I was going downstream. Things were streaming with me. Um, and waking up now is, uh, the best way to describe it is I feel like I'm on 10 hits of acid. Just like 24 mm. seven. Yeah. Um, and I need tethers to reality. And it's been even the past two weeks, like I started listening to all these monks talk and like just all of these things that I've been grasping out in the world that I like wouldn't have ima imagined myself doing because it feels like I need something. Mm. Um, because the experience and feeling like I had made a mistake or the wrongness of it then sort of like snowballed into me having trust issues with myself and feel like I can't trust myself with decisions and with things. And because I feel like I slowed down and I really thought about the thing that I then felt regret about. Um, and that can be really scary, especially when you're somebody like myself who does have a lot of intentional practices to be present and mindful. And mm. um, so much of this realization has come too from, I think I get myself into trouble thinking myself into anything. And then feeling is really my only way of navigation in this world. And it's been confusing because feeling has gotten me into a lot of trouble too. Um, it's but, all trouble down here. But God damn it, is it the is it authentic? You know, when you come home to feeling and um, honoring it, and uh, thought is less of an authentic thing because I don't think we are thoughts. We have thoughts. You know, like we're the reception of the thoughts, but we don't. We're not always the conception of them. Because, we're not birthing because thoughts. yeah, like you have this influence around you all the time from all of these different things, um, and I think. I'm somebody who's incredibly influenced by so many different things. Um, and 
uh, we're all complex. I don't want to say I'm more complex than anybody else, but I have, I have a lot of contradictions like in my personality because I have a lot of like opposing opinions and, yeah. um, it feels like I got crushed by like the complexity that I created in my life. <laughs> You know, like which is I, which is wanting to present a certain way and then getting this tattoo that you felt was pushing you towards the opposite. Yeah. Yeah. And this is happening real time in front of us. Mm -hmm. It felt like slow motion. Mm -hmm. Every day felt like 10 years. I, and I didn't know what was going on with you. And you probably didn't want to speak to it. Yeah. Thinking what? Like. That, that why didn't I want to speak to it? Yeah. Oh, just being so embarrassed that I was going through what I was going through. And it, I mean, it's. Yeah, uh, like incredibly. Shame do, is like the main thing that I was circling around the whole time. It was like a, a, a shame loop. Does it help at all that you have like me and Cass that like flatter your body and we really do like worship at the Church of Merit? Does like, does that help at all? Or like these stories so powerful it doesn't even like, would it have helped if you were like, does, hey guys, I'm fucking, I'm having regret about getting this. Can we have a little ceremony where we can integrate it? you know, or, or whatever. Like I, I, wa I wish I could have known so I could have helped more. Yeah. Well, I think part of what was hard for me was, was realizing that I cared what you thought. Like that uh, was another yeah. realization I came to. Like I've been so independent my whole life. Like even the guys that I dated that like I, you know, was like super serious with like, I didn't, I just didn't care. Like my, my, like I was so headstrong. I was so independent. Like I wasn't, even as bendable as I am, like I wasn't, I wasn't really like bending that much for these people when I was younger. And I really come to this place of like honoring who I am and realizing who I am and in relationship and then feeling like I should have had you more involved and then feeling like I was going to lose you guys. And that was like a, a lot of what spun me out was realizing like, what's the most important thing to me in my life. And like, did I just destroy that by like following these patterns of shame and that are just putting me into more patterns of shame? Um, because, oh, that's the other thing too is, uh, I have a bunch of lasered skin on my back, which is like the reason I got this tattoo. I like wouldn't have gotten tattooed if I didn't have a bunch of lasered skin on my back. That really didn't look like anything, but I was so, again, stuck in this loop of shame and then making decisions out of shame. And you guys are deeper into like a shame hole. <laughs> oh, man. Um, Kurt has that song, Shame Chamber. <laughs> shame shame it's Chamber. It's a fucking shame chamber. It is a wild <laughs> place. It's one of the most hellish places on earth. Yeah. And that's, and that was, that's like one of the deepest, biggest realizations for me is like being more very mindful about the place that I'm making choices from because I thought I was, but those were still like in places of insecurity, mm. you know, instead of following excitement, instead of following the things that I was excited about, it was following the things that made me insecure. And of course it always doubles down in tenfolds. Um, so I think it was, yeah, it was like, it was helpful, th like that I have you guys and you love me, but at the same time too, it was like, fuck, like, did I fuck up this thing? That's like the most important thing to me. And then getting on a loop of like, I don't want to be thinking about my body and I don't want to think about bodies at all in general. Mm. And, uh, I can't realize if that's like my larger spiritual journey compounding into like, a uh, a, a more intense version of that, you know, cause we're all just becoming a spirit. Like we're all leaving body. And I don't know if that's like that desire in me just trying to come through earlier than it should. Um, <clears throat> but, um, I think, I've been incredibly overwhelmed by the limitations of my body my whole life. And uh, um, sometimes I think it's just like I need to be a monk and never think about a body ever again. <laughs> <laughs> You're ridiculous. You're so hard on yourself. Mary. It's crazy. Because I, I come in like a fucking spiritual drill sergeant. and uh, You know, you give me a clue into this and I come in dropping hammers left and right. Because I'm freaking out myself, you know? I, I'm like, because I love you so much and I care about you. And like, man, I never thought about tattoos before I met you. And now I'm like, God damn, look at this beautiful museum of art Mara has on her. And like, it just goes so well with the way you look. And just like, you've made such tasteful choices, including this new one, which is like my favorite thing you have. So when you're like, yo, um, just real quick, I'm going to get this removed when we go back. I'm like, oh, Lord, like I, I felt so overwhelmed and, and helpless in this moment, but I needed it. I really needed it because, uh, man, I, I've been I'm feeling a lot better since whatever that put me through. It was like a mushroom trip. Yeah, that put that, that was a lot. And it's not your fault. Like, um, I mean, it is, but it's OK. We've just merged so much that I could feel that I felt 
everything that that meant and I just really felt it and I, I just uh, panicked a little bit and I just had to reclaim uh, the sovereignty over my experience and um, kind of set you free of whatever judgment or feeling I would have about anything you do so you can do it, you know? And I hope the same from you, you know? Like kind of it just like brought me to this moment of like, oh, Mare's going to do what she's going to do with her body. You know, and I, I have to love and accept her for that. And, and I'm going to do what I need to do with my body. And she does love and accept me for that. And so it just really freaked me out. That it really, that, that was crazy. That was like an unintended psychedelic journey I wasn't ready for because it was very unexpected. You know, you just kind of like dropped on me that you were going to get this, this tattoo removed and that it's going to take so long. And I know it's painful. I know it's much more painful than getting tattoos. And, uh, yeah, <clears throat> I was in flow before that. I feel like we were in a deep place. Like I'm, I'm listening to this guy, Dr. David Hawkins, and like taking mushrooms and like being able to channel some beautiful stuff. And that, like I just feel like that like pulled me back down to like earthly things and like worrying about someone is such like a helpless thing. You know, it's probably a useless feeling. So that's probably why I really had to come up in a major way you know yeah uh, yeah and and something beyond my comprehension you know that's why i keep asking i'm like has anyone ever done this before do you know people that like get tattoos and then get them removed like that's how, like i'm 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 not being a dick when i'm I'm trying to i'm like as sweet and, and innocent as as possible when i'm asking you that like because i'm like yo is this a mental health thing or is this like just like how it is or? yeah but see that's the most <laughs> fascinating point about this whole thing is it a mental health thing that's the most interesting question yeah. because at my lowest and at my most fearful um and that's how I know all this mental health thing is such a fucking schmear. Those thoughts come up. You start not trusting yourself and you start thinking like, do I need medication? Like, should I just turn into a zombie? Should I just, um, throw in the towel and mental health, like me- even saying that word, am I sick? Yeah, yeah. Is there something wrong with me? And of course, yes is the answer to both of those questions. Is it helpful for me to invest in the answer to both of those questions? No. <laughs> um, because the reality is you're incarnated because you're sick. Like I'm sick and you're sick and we all have these distortions, right, about ourselves and like the ab- ways that we abuse the world around us mm-hmm. and we're all trying to like burn that away. And I just happen to be incredibly abusive towards myself and that's like how my pattern is. You can see it in my birth chart. It's all lumped like in the inner, in the inner issues. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, fuck. Sorry. It's okay. You can chill. You're killing it. I'm talking about some wild shit right now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I just think it's it's never been helpful for me to solidify um, the states of consciousness at which I'm worried about, which is what all pathology is and diagnosis is, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. You're like, okay, this is the, what you are. And, something and then I will be, be that forever. Out. Yes. You know? Yeah. Um, I mean, I remember even meeting with somebody about my eating disorder when I was younger and her, she's her saying, you're going to deal with this the rest of your life. And it made me want to die. I was like, just yeah. kill me then. Like, like, let's just do it. And that's, I mean, that's how I felt from a young age battling this thing because it took up 90% of my day and I tried alone to conquer it and fight it in years and years and it didn't, and it, it makes you want to give up, you know, that yeah. feeling of powerlessness, um, and really the only way out is to feel powerful, you know, and to yeah. not outsource and to start insourcing and stuff. Um, but yeah, when, when this stuff happens and you start to lose your mind and the other way that I de- would describe of like what's happening to me other than just like the circumstance of getting tattooed, it also just feels like my body chose to expand, like this tattoo expanded me at that moment yeah, beyond yeah. a place that my physical body was ready for and yes. it drove me crazy, you know? <laughs> I agree. It, and and it, I, I agree in so many ways, but think about what you put on yourself too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> your body's like, what the fuck? flaming lotus <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah you shall change no much no yes lotus. <laughs> yes exactly so you had to start living the symbology you put on yourself like that day it was crazy it really really yeah. was crazy yeah um and yeah yeah so just with the mental health stuff like i i try i try and just bet on change yeah. You know, and I and I'm trying to align myself with that and becoming more and more in line with that because 
betting on mental health, like going down that path, like yeah. betting on me, conti- it will continue to get worse. Yeah, well, and yeah, it continues you know? the story that you're over. That I need help. That yeah. I can't do it myself. It's yeah. Like, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And uh, I mean, it's sad because I think it, it's so easy to get stuck on, the, stuck on the shame loop because when you're so self-loathing, you come to a realization of how selfish it is. Mm. You know? I've, I've, I, like, I think I was screaming that at you when I was oh, in yeah. my flow state. I, yeah. I, that wasn't me. That was like something else. I know. <laughs> I wish I would have recorded it because it was probably just a lot of shit my soul needed to hear. And it's like, I'm going to say it into the mirror. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. 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 And, uh, yeah, I don't know what, it, what I'm going to do with lasering. I think partially some of that probably is like a pain thing that I think I deserve to be in pain. <clears throat> there haven't been a lot of years in my life that I haven't been bleeding, you know? Uh, yeah. Either getting something or getting something removed. There hasn't been a lot of months since I've known you that you haven't gotten something or gotten something removed. Yeah. Um, so I think I'm just coming to realize I'm changed. I'm changing so fast now. I can't change my body anymore. <laughs> well, well, you, uh, you treat this thing like an etch a sketch, and it, it's going to take its toll. You're young now, but like you know, it, it's and I know it was upsetting to hear. But one of the things I was saying to you was like, why are you programming yourselves with this level of indecision? about you know what i mean yeah like, i, I know like you don't agree like with that. you and i like kind of don't agree with you i don't I, agree with because me. i because i think some people because there's this whole like trauma's trapped in your body thing that we say with mental health and i think that gets people really stuck and i think the reality is your mind is free and if you go through trauma it doesn't need to be like ingrained oh, no. in your body you can clear that shit oh absolutely and uh, i'm fucking deadpool I'm Wolverine. Yes. I'm only getting stronger. Yeah, you are. You just got to tell me every now and then. When the optics start getting like this, you got to just give me the sign like I'm cool or I'm not cool. We got to have some sort of safe word or something. You yeah. Know? Like yeah. like where it's just like, bro, intervene. Because you are my fucking prize fighter. Me and Cass treat you like that. And like you get in the <laughs> ring and you do spiritual battle and like. You know, one of the things that your fucking, you know, your your trainers that are in your corner have to do is realize, like, when the fight's gotten too much and you've taken too many blows, to throw in the towel, and that means the referee calls the thing off. Yeah. And I was, a couple times on that trip, had to throw in the towel, and I think it helped us turn corners. That I just feel way better now. I feel closer yeah. to you now. Yeah. I feel like... uh just we're getting to a place that uh, I've always kind of wanted to be with you. And I think we're getting there now. And and it takes getting to know each other. It takes being vulnerable. It's like we live with each other for three weeks in L.A. and lose our minds together. Fuck. Yeah. Well, I'm brought to my knees, too. Like, if there is any arrogance left in me, which there was, you know, mm. like that shit shook right loose. Yeah. And, and then we were throwing mushrooms on top of it, too, just in case, you know. I, I needed her. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's <laughs> it's one of the man. things, we, like we were referencing this Lee Scratch Perry documentary. Yeah. And um, he burned down his studio intentionally. And they, they, they filmed a little bit of it for this, or he has f- f- video footage of it. And it's like really haunting ceremony, but like... Man, I don't know. He just takes he t- just takes things to an extreme. Yeah, that's why I was saying before, like this was your version of that. Oh, that was when I was watching it. That was what I was thinking. You know, um, yeah, was the similar. Well, because he was talking about you, you have to be reborn in this lifetime. This is Jesus. The whole teaching Jesus is talking about. You yes, know? you have to. And be. in order to be reborn, you have to die. Yeah, and uh, you know that it's painful, but you have to do that within the human incarnation. I, yeah. It was. It felt very timely that coming into my life, as as all art does, you know. <clears throat> and it's crazy because we were just we were gonna watch something else last night, and we and I was like, let me just open up the Criterion portal and make sure there's nothing cool. And yeah. the first thing we saw, yeah. I was like, there's a Lee Scratch Perry documentary. Yeah. Let's throw this fucking thing on. And we had you had no idea that it no. was gonna be what it was. No, I warned you. I was, I said it, it'll be something because it's on this channel. Yeah. Like it's going to be something. Yeah. Um probably not a wikipedia entry yeah. um but yeah i didn't know it would be look any any good art can be that at any time for anyone you know 
Yeah, but it's definitely not random. Like when no. you know when art different artists come into your life and different art and you know. Yeah. I try and really trust that now. Even just with music, like with you know if whatever I'm covering, I'm like whatever it, I'm excited about that's new right now. Whatever comes in, you just honor that. Absolutely. Just, Absolutely. And, you know, uh, I took you for your third ween initiation the other <laughs> night, a couple nights ago. You don't, th- how do you get a thousand songs? It, it, and then they haven't written one in 20 years. So it's like, how do you get there? It's like the inspiration came in, they focused, and they said, let's finish this thing right now. Yeah. And let's record it right now. Yeah. And that's, and then it's off the table. Yeah. And, you know, you can decide from there what you want to see the light of day or what you want to represent you, if you or want to whatever. Do a remaster or reversion or yeah, you know. yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. But uh, you know, one of the things uh, that we, we were we had a great night with Jim James of My Morning Jacket, the best out in LA. Yeah. That was that was surreal. Yeah, you know what yeah. I mean. Like, yeah. we love his album Eternally Even. That's, yeah, that's fucking classic. Yeah. If you're tripping. And having a good time, throw that thing on. I am obsessed with his album with the Louisville Orchestra, too. I haven't heard that. Yeah, it's like my favorite. I adore it. Because oh, cool. he's so big and so, you know, like, yeah. and you hear him and you hear that and you hear that in all of his music, but just with an orchestra, it feels like very honoring him and yeah. his spirit. And yeah. But what was crazy, and the reason I bring it up, I'm not just a random name dropper. And if yeah. I were, you would know a lot more <laughs> about my celebrity <laughs> encounters, but I hold it back. But uh, on this night, uh, out of nowhere he starts talking about how you don't don't do demos and i'm like oh this this moment in time come to you by this person at this moment is <laughs> crafted for mayor like th- it's like oh, there it is cool like he's saying to just fucking get over yourself and skip the part of the process that you feel is a hurdle yeah or just make that the process or yeah. whatever the fuck it is. But he's like, and especially somebody that has such big production to be saying that. It's true. It's true. And I have like, yeah. So he's like, I don't really do demos. Like, um, he's like, I'll whisper into, I'll, I'll whisper melodies into my, my voice yeah. memos or whatever. But yeah, I, you yeah. know, if I make a demo, it actually ends up being the thing. Yeah, the thing. Yeah. Yes. He said lots of fruitful stuff. That was probably the most poignant, but. Um, yeah, yeah, we I, had so much. Fun. I also think the, the most fruitful thing um, uh, for me and for you is seeing how how humble and normal a guy is, and to the point where the first time I met him, I didn't even think it was him. You know, I hung out with him all night, and at the end of the night, I was like, "Wait, you are Jim James!" Like, holy shit! I don't know what to attribute it to other than my one data point, which is that he has great friends. And I know you gotta get good, have keep good friends if you're famous. To, yes. To keep good, you know. Close, you know. Yeah. Him and uh, but I don't Elle know what and else. Johnny. Him and Ellen Johnny, those are the best yeah. kind of people. And I don't know what else he does to get, keep his head on the straight. You know? I do. You do. I mean, fucking some ayahuasca. Oh. You know. What I'm <laughs> Okay. He's a different yeah. dude than when I first met him three years ago. Okay. Yeah. This time is a different dude, and I don't know. The one factor seemed to be, and like, keep this between us, motherfuckers, <laughs> ayahuasca, you know, which I will take a lot of credit for just fucking making a big, the, the first time when, when we met and hung out with him th- three, four years ago, I just turned the whole conversation to psychedelics the whole night. And like he became, he got really into it and we kept, uh, you know, we kept hanging out on the course of us being out there on that, that trip, that trip. And we were just talking a lot about psychedelics and how it's helped me and like yada, yada, yada. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if he wants that out there, but it's just shut up people. Just don't say anything. It's, we're all just, we're making shit up. We but are. <laughs> we're just having fun. <laughs> but, we, uh, you know, we, we have a night like that and it's like. Uh, just coming together with like-minded folks who are um, other artists, who are other songwriters, like, yes. and merging vibes and like seeing how much we inspire them yeah. inspires me. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? Like they needed that. Yeah. They needed to come over and just fucking dance in our kitchen all night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When we're good, we can have, I think, the most fun goofball energy. Healing. Yeah, triangles. Is, yeah. It's the strongest shape, you yeah. know? Yeah. I when really, we're good. Yeah. But it's... I really brought us down there for a second. When we're not we were good, with- we're like a ninja star. Just yeah. fucking stick in anything and deflate yeah. it. Yeah, it's not great. 
Um, but yeah, we were hanging out with your friend Johnny, and I fucking have been so into Johnny's music. Johnny Fritz, look him up. Johnny Fritz. Um, yeah, it's just so feel good and fun, and his Church of Chill that he did with you, I think it's been very influential, because I've been really into country music this week. Well, Old country music. Well, it's, yeah. I mean, the thing about country, and we were talking about this, because Johnny did like a three-hour Church of Chill with, a, with us. Yeah. Um, that's just deep country grooves. Deep, deep. Deep, deep. Like fucking um, deep sea. And that, that's on uh, patreon.com slash Church of Chill, episode 132 of Church of Chill. An amazing fucking time. Yeah. And we left the mics going the whole time, so you could hear us dancing, and you, you can hear... Two hours into it, Jim telling you, don't do demos. <laughs> That's I left it in there. Epic. Yeah. Um, but the, we were saying that the thing about country music is like, it's just one of those cliche things. It's like, oh, I like everything except rap and country. It's just yeah. like, mm, you probably do like those things. You just haven't been exposed to it. And I used to think I didn't like country music until I started road tripping with Johnny. And that Church of Chill episode is like an example of what it feels like. He yeah. just tells a story and then he plays a song and then he tells a story and he plays a song and you just fucking hear this genre in a whole different way when you hear it's real, the real craftsman of it. Yeah. Well, you know who broke me into country originally was Patsy Cline. Like I always said that oh, too. Yeah. Like I'm into yeah. all genres of music, but <laughs> except for country, but Patsy Cline and Johnny Cash. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, and they're you great know? too fucking great they're great they're undeniable um, but those are that's like the you know, mainstream whatever and of course there's just like especially in the genre of country you know fame is definitely not the um no well we best. watched uh heartworn highways the other night seek that documentary <laughs> that's out. the best music documentary i've ever seen yeah like come on it's it, from 1976 i don't even know what to compare it to yeah and i wouldn't I, even know how to describe and I it i want to listen to that guy's music that f- first starts yeah, it with the voice yeah. But, like, these guys are fucking incredible, and they're not household names. The only person... Every one of them is seriously so incredible. You would recognize, like, Towns Van Zandt is in it, and he's incredible in it, and Guy Clark's in it, and he's also incredible. And they're both just beautiful on camera and just, just perfect and warm, but... It takes you through all these other, like, outlaw country characters of the early mid-70s. And beautifully shot, like beautifully colored. And, oh um, my god! Like yeah, just uh, like that was a probably time my time machine. That's right. Yeah, total time machine. Just puts you in it. Yeah. and you're you're off to the races. And that was probably my seventh time seeing it, and it felt like the first <laughs> time. Every time it feels like the first time. I mean, I'm gonna make you. The, the crazy thing is, like, you're gonna become a documentary expert from just hanging out with me. <laughs> I know. Because like. Why not watch these fucking things? I oh, love yeah. revisiting them, especially now that I'm getting back into the filmmaking. Yeah. Um, but Heartworn Highways, what a great it just, name too. I know, I, it, they it's, it. it's they nailed it. It it looks the way it sounds, you know. Um, but that, yeah, it just shows you and and like when Johnny plays these deep cuts and shit, it's like, man, there's a rich tradition in that that is like in country music that is like fucking hits such a sweet spot that nothing else can even touch you it's know? so true I, yeah. I, yeah it feels very very homely wholesome american yeah you know yeah ween has their country album too 12 golden country greats that employed many of those guys so like we see these guys and like these legendary nashville musicians ween just hired all the top ones for i didn't 12. know that but that's how they did that i thought that yeah. was just them that's why the album's called 12 golden country greats oh. there's only 10 songs on it but they hired 12 oh. these 12 musicians okay that like um a couple of them were scared to put their names on it because they were like i don't know what my wife's gonna think about that you know like that kind of like wholesome <laughs> yeah you know yeah. This is like old guys that, uh, yeah, that made this uh, incredible album. A lot of great songs on there. Yeah, man, we've been we've been uh, we've been going fucking wild lately. Yeah, I've been getting into the writing of Eddie Arnold. That's yes. like what fifties country. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, his writing is great, and Kitty Wells. Mm. Damn, this is a great episode to have a little notepad for yeah. some uh, little She's rabbit great. holes. Deep, deep old country too. Um, yeah, what else have we been getting into? Um, Leon GHB. Russell, GHB. You want to talk about that for a second? <laughs> we can give them something sexy. <laughs> 
Yeah, we got into GHB a couple times. And, it was uh, a gift. Um, you know, a friend of ours dropped off a bottle for my birthday. And yeah. like any new drug, it just kind of sits around and we kind of familiarize ourselves with its aura before mm-hmm. we ever <laughs> take it. <laughs> and we talk about it and then we don't, you know. And so we tried it and it doesn't really feel like anything, but it's an aphrodisiac, uh, which does feel like something. It, it is an aphrodisiac, I would say. I really wouldn't say that about anything else we take. Weed can be that. Yeah. I don't even know if I, yeah. It's, it just, it's, it's, our life is an aphrodisiac. Kind of, yeah. It's, it, it, yeah. That's <laughs> definitely true. It extends things. It definitely makes things a little more trippy. I feel a little bit like you could compare it a little to alcohol. And I know that's just like comparing food to chicken. It's not a very good reference. Yeah. But. <laughs> well, it, it, you're not losing any motor functions. You're not, it's not like that. Um, but it is. I think, yeah, you are. Oh, you are? Yeah. See, usually when I drink, the first sign that I've been drinking is my speech starts just getting a little slurry and slower. And I'm like, GHB, I kind of feel like crisp and alive. Yeah. But yeah, a little, yeah, kind of like alcohol. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like slightly disassociative. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, we we like a trippy experience. I think we have another session yeah. available. Yeah. This bo- yeah. We, this bottle, like it's weird because we've done it now twice. Three times. Three times, a lady. Yeah, <laughs> and we do it. Or we. This is like the only drug we really do an intentional sex ceremony around. Yeah. And it seems to really work for that. Yeah. But then again, wouldn't anything if we were being intentional about it? Yeah. Are we just imbuing this thing? <laughs> yes. With like horniness energy. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny. That's funny. We should do it with other well, things. Well, that's what I was thinking about it when I was like, I wonder why disassociated would ever be really like associated with sex because sex is like an embodied practice yeah. and you were like and of course i thought in my brain just like you said like it lowers inhibitions but i'm like but that's kind of just like a human distortion thing like yeah once you can drop down and, and yeah. be present and intimate you should need something to disassociate you know and yeah I think we do imbue these things with that obviously i mean we kind of did that with ketamine at first and ketamine's like you know you're totally out of your body disassociative and yeah. we had lots of like crazy um yeah sexual nights things. Yeah, a lot of wild times, but I don't associate that with something. We're also doing ketamine late at night, and that's not my sexiest time of the day. My sexiest time of the day is like when the lights are, <laughs> when, the, when the sun lights out. Yeah, I guess that's the other fun thing about GHB is maybe like because we use it late at night, it feels like a late night drug. Yeah. The date rape drug. Yeah. Um, <laughs> maybe it can make you feel more frisky then. Mm. Frisky business. Frisky business. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but that's been fun. Yeah, it has you, been fun. You don't want to mix that with anything else. No. Uh, yeah, and your tolerance never goes up, which is interesting. Seems like your tolerance would go up with anything. Yeah. That you were bringing into the fold, but. Yeah. yeah. I think that's why, uh, like, people use it for sleep. Bodybuilders use it because it's one of those things. It's like supposedly good for when you get deep rest like that it it helps you regenerate muscles that's cool. really quick so like before ghb you know you would like wail on your pecs and annihilate your fucking biceps but then have to break from that shit for like two three days with ghb you don't have to break you just go home you take some ghb you fucking sleep like a uh, fucking michael jackson yeah and <laughs> fucking get up and hit the gym again, you know? Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I wouldn't necessarily go fucking around with this stuff unless you have a trusted doctor in your life, which is who we got this from. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's, I'm glad that we did that, that doctors. I think that's been the number one benefit of having this podcast besides meeting people like yourself is meeting the trusted people that would give me the drug experiences I otherwise would have never tried because I'm too scared of overdosing or getting poisoned or it's an incredible just, portal to connection yeah 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 what uh, have this podcast yeah yeah totally <laughs> totally yeah yeah in every way and um yeah you really want to trust the people you're getting your drugs from and um with community being so spread out and so dispersed, it's getting harder and harder these days. So it does feel like a blessing to have that and have the community we have and 
be able to spread the good word and share the good sacraments and yeah um, you know uh yeah if you come across some good shit you gotta spread the good word you know we're all santa just like we're all jesus (laughs) (laughs) santa jesus Has anyone ever done that? <laughs> Has anyone ever done art with like uh, Santa nailed up to the cross and dying for our sins? No, that sounds like Cass's next painting. That does. You could do that for us. While yeah. We, yeah. That she, she'd fun. probably think it's too violent. Yeah. Santa Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I'll write a song for it. I'll, I'll finish the parody of that. Yeah. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Isn't this atrium beautiful? It's, we're at this incredible house in Austin. Sorry, I didn't even let you introduce the episode. Yeah, right yeah, we're here. We're in um, Austin, New York, which isn't far from uh, where, where my parents are, are, where we usually are. My yeah, parents live parents up here, are. and Cass's dad. Mm-hmm. But uh, Mayor rented this incredible house with a humongous backyard. We'll do a bunch of podcasts from up here. Yeah, the trees feel like they're healing me. Yeah. It's nice to attune to them. Yeah. Yeah, I've been uh, attuned to the mushroom a lot lately. I think that's my my number one love affair lately. And I think it's it's how I've been able to show up for you and Cass even. Because yeah. I, I wasn't really doing that good yeah. either in right. my life. And uh, the mushroom really bailed us out. I spoke about that on the last podcast, but I've kept it going. And um, I'm going to do some intergenerational shit with my parents. Hell yeah. But, uh, yeah, we'll do a podcast after that too. Maybe your mom can go. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that would be really cool. I'll, I'll try to, uh, I'll try to convince her to do that. Okay. Yeah. Cause I I would, I would love to hear, I've just, what, what, yeah, what she has to say about it. And, uh, it's, it's the, it's the fruition and the culmination of like, uh, eight or 10 year thing for me where like, I randomly took mushrooms one night. I had never taken them before and I was 32 years old and I feel like I fucking died for my sins Mm -hmm. and my family's sins that Mm -hmm. day, you know, Mm -hmm. on the fucking bathroom floor. I had Mm -hmm. to fucking die for our sins and come back with the knowledge, uh, you know, the cheat codes. Yeah. Yeah. For how to fucking get through and, and, and be bright because, you know, my family have been through so much tragedy. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why my mom wants to do the mushrooms at this point and i hope she will uh because she could easily bail but i think she's going towards it because she's still in grief over my sister who died fucking 15 16 years ago well and they've been helping her she's been microdosing, microdosing yeah and yeah and caitlin my sister yeah i gave we we made these microdoses mm-hmm. and we gave them to my parents thinking whatever well, they'll just be around up here they'll never take them but they started taking them and caitlin started having the least amount of seizure she's ever had. They totally changed the aura of the house. Um, my parents are like, oh, we can't even feel them. I'm like, don't worry. Everyone feels them. And I know because my mom's calling me every day. Yeah. She feels more connected. And um, Yeah, the microdose has really, really, really helped. That, that really... Uh, I, you know, for Caitlin to have five months in a row with 10 or less seizures per month is that's the least seizures she's had in 34 years. You know, it's incredible. It's crazy. And I, I fucking say, I think it's because of the mushroom, because I think it, it, it connects you more. And, um, Caitlin just, it, it, all these seizures are is like a fucking static that comes through. And this is like, they help you tune to a station, you know, the mushrooms, I think mm-hmm. that's, that's a, it's a higher frequency that I, yeah. I think Caitlin <coughs> is, um, <clears throat> a little more angelic and Mm -hmm. i think that uh, epilepsy has uh, kept her um very innocent Mm -hmm. so she hasn't had the veil pulled over her the way a lot of people have when Mm -hmm. you get sent out into school in a Mm -hmm. certain way and into uh real life and relationships and friendships and heartbreak and the job force all this stuff she hasn't been able to do because she's Mm -hmm. just been at home having seizures Mm -hmm. So she's very close to source. Yep. And my parents are medicating in every way fucking possible. Yes. It's like coffee and CNN blasting from every room and screaming about Trump and this and that. And then you give them these mushrooms and the conversation just completely changed. And Caitlin's not having seizures. It's like, come on. It doesn't take a genius to put two and two together. Caitlin doesn't need to take them. We do. Yeah. 
we do. And I, I, these are downloads I got from, uh, I, I will say from my sister, Aaron, when mm-hmm. I took LSD out in Joshua tree and just breathed Aaron into me. And she said, you got to see, we got to heal everything around Caitlin, not necessarily yeah. Caitlin. Caitlin's healing, mm-hmm. but we have to, uh, improve the environment around her. And I came back with those messages and my parents listened. I said, we have to, uh, I'm sorry. We have to, uh, stop eating like shit. Mm-hmm. And they did. And Caitlin mm-hmm. stopped eating like shit and it helped a lot. Yeah. Yeah. That helps, uh, clear the static a little bit. And there's lots of ways you can do it. Mm-hmm. And, um, I think this is going to be a big one the, with the mushrooms. Yeah. And I, I really believe in microdosing, uh, Oh, yeah. I don't think everybody needs to take an eighth or a hero's dose or whatever. No. I, I recommend no. it, obviously. But um, I think your mom is going to love it. Oh, yeah. And and she wants she, to meet the aliens. Yeah. Like, she, she wants to fucking trip. Yeah. 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 I, and I, yeah, I think there is, is a, it seems like you do get something different out of the bigger experiences as well. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, no, I'm really excited about it. Yeah, well, we'll see what comes of it. It's uh, it's one of those things like um, and we're pitching a series right now mm-hmm. that's families tripping together. It's called yep. the Family Trip. It's cool. Uh, hopefully, we'll get to make that as like a series for one of these platforms. But the cool and 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 what I've built into the pitch is to follow up and shoot something with them, like six weeks to six months later. That's when it's interesting. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like you know, someone has a trip and it's. They come back down to earth and, you know, they talk about it and it's kind of like, it, it's it's profound, but it's more profound to them because you're not seeing any lasting change right then and there. You couldn't, you know, yeah. it's like them telling you about a dream. Right. But when you see them and catch up with them six weeks, six months later, if they tried to stay attuned to that station. Yeah. It's, that's where you, it seems like a miracle had taken place. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I said it before, I'll say it again. And I've said it, I said it in this pitch. America does not have a depression epidemic. It has a mushroom deficiency. Like we've gotten away from our connection to the land, our connection to each other, you know, our connection to um, our self worth. Mm-hmm. And the mushroom connects, reconnects us to that. And for a portion of our history, which is in the grand scheme of things, a blink of an eye, this stuff has been prohibited. And look what it's led to. Yeah. So. I personally don't care that I'm operating on the fringes of legality because uh, any government that would make this illegal should be illegal. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. For me to save my family, get the fuck out of here. Any, Bring me, to, I will fucking, come on. Any government saying anything that grows from the earth is illegal is, is illegal. Yeah. <laughs> That's illegal. <laughs> can't you can't legalize or illegalize reality, you know? Jesus Christ. Um, yeah, don't get me started about the government. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Goddamn. <laughs> well, speaking of which, I do have a phone call. I have a pitch meeting. So this was a pleasure. Thanks for doing a podcast with me. Yeah. We'll touch back base um, with the people. There'll probably be lots of stuff on the Patreon yeah. this next couple of weeks while we chill up here. And uh, that's patreon.com slash church of chill. We deeply appreciate the support. It's what is helping us get by right now. So thanks for listening. Thanks to us. y'all. Thank you, Mayor. That was really yeah incredible and love vulnerable. You guys. Love you. Peace, love and magic. <laughs>